Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for attending our webinar on mindful eating for your fertility journey. We're excited to have Petra Bomer here with us. Um, she is the founder of the Mindful Eating Institute. Okay, next slide. So um, my name is Dr. Susan Maxwell. I am one of the reproductive endocrinologists at Southern California Reproductive Center. I practice out of our Santa Barbara office. We also have locations in Beverly Hills and Pasadena. I am board certified in both obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility. I completed my residency and fellowship at New York University School of Medicine. And I moved from New York City about eight months ago to Santa Barbara, where I've been practicing. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. Petra is a mindful living expert and founder of the Mindful Eating Institute in Santa Barbara. She has two decades of experience promoting positive lifestyles and is a pioneer in blending Eastern and Western therapeutic approaches in the realm of emotional eating, weight management, and self-care. She has a master's degree in clinical psychology from the University of Hamburg. She's held influential work-life balance workshops at the California Health and Longevity Institute. And she was a keynote speaker for the American Heart Association on stress and eating and has presented at Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Mm -hmm. At SCRC, we have a proven track record of more than 25 years of experience in infertility. We have two state-of-the-art embryology labs. One is in Beverly Hills and the other in Santa Barbara. And then we have three clinical locations in Beverly Hills, Pasadena, and Santa Barbara. Next slide. We have um, premier laboratory and surgery centers. And what sets apart our um, ART labs is we have experienced and certified laboratory directors with double witnessing verifications of all gametes. We perform vitrification, which is a flash freezing technique for all of our uh, eggs and embryos. We perform a lot of blastocyst biopsies for pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, as well as looking for monogenic disorders. And we also have embryoscopes, which allow us to do time-lapse video imaging of embryo development in both of our laboratory locations. Next slide, please. Today, we will be discussing weight and how it relates to fertility and mindful eating and self-care. And then we'll go through the age factor and how it relates to infertility and patient testing for fertility, our treatment options that we have available, and then you'll be able to meet our team members. At the end, we will go through a question and answer session. Okay, next slide. Go so ahead, it's Patrick. my turn. Mm -hmm. Yes, hi everyone. I am happy to be here and I'll be sharing some insights uh, regarding weight management without the use of um, restrictive diets. Uh, we'll be talking about mindful eating and emotional eating. And um, if somebody tries to get pregnant, particularly for IVF procedures, being at your healthy weight will help you with improved fertility, enhanced success with IVF procedures, reduced pregnancy complications, optimizing hormonal balance, and then healthy baby development. <clears throat> so next slide, please. When I started my Mindful Eating Institute, I had left a clinic where I taught strict behavior management and weight loss and realized that my patients would gain weight back when emotional eating uh, remained unaddressed. In one of my many presentations, I um, touch on this study by over a thousand psychologists who confirm that understanding and managing not just the behaviors, but the emotions related to weight management are critical. And emotional eating is a important barrier to weight loss. Also, um, weaving in 
cognitive behavioral therapy, problem solving, and mindfulness are excellent and good weight loss uh, weight loss strategies. I meditate at uh, the beginning of each session with my patients, and I also invite them to build in mindfulness into their daily lives. And we'll talk more about emotional eating um, in a few minutes. Next slide, please. I am a big fan of self-compassion. <laughs> That's why I chose the topic of self-compassion and weight loss as a winning combination. When we're hard on ourselves and feel we need more restriction and wanting to force outcomes, it is counterproductive. There's a lot of research that confirms that when we are kind and have empathy and compassion for ourselves, um, weight management will be, be easier and has more long-term success. Enhancing mindful and intuitive eating increases healthy behavior, and that makes a lot of sense. It's the opposite of being on a restrictive diet. Next slide. What is mindful eating? I always say it's just um, the umbrella thought is mindful living. Mindful eating is one part of our lives. What I mean by mindful eating is unplugging from electronics, not eating at your desk, um, in front of your computer, not watching TV while you're eating. Mindfulness is being present and aware and intentional, and that can radiate out into other areas of our lives. Practice mindful eating um, by carving out time for yourself and your family and be mindful and present with the food that's right in front of you. And some tips on how to do this and practice in, in your daily life. Ask family members to put their phones in a basket and say, we're going to focus on our meal. Let's tell some stories. You can also invite friends over and say, you know, let's have a mindful meal, which is very different of maybe eating at a loud restaurant or rushing to get to the show on television. So mindfulness is bringing the energy down, slowing down in general, and being aware and intentional. Next slide. Emotional eating is when we eat and are not physically hungry. A lot of my clients eat late at night. They eat perfectly throughout the day, and then nighttime comes around. And when you're exhausted, when you're anxious or stressed and reach for food and aren't physically hungry, that is emotional eating. And of course, it affects us negatively when we use food as a mood regulator. Some strategies to identify and manage emotional eating behaviors is to practice a mindful pause when you feel like you want to go back to the kitchen, back to the fridge, if you can pause and ask yourself, now, wait a minute, am I hungry? Not really. What am I in need of? Maybe you are in need of a little bit of a supportive conversation or venting or whatever it is, maybe more human connection. I post, I used the picture of the chocolate because one of my clients learned by working with me to identify what she was really in need of. And one evening she was pacing through the kitchen looking for more sweets. And she said, wait a minute, I don't need sugar. What I really need is a hug. So she went over to the sitting area where her husband was watching a movie. And she says, honey, I need a cuddle. So do you need chocolate or a hug is one of the questions. And my invitation to all of you who are listening right now is have compassion for yourself if you are an emotional eater. Behavior makes sense and there are other ways and other rituals to help you cope with stressful situations. Next slide. Emotional self-care is key, and I teach all my clients honoring their true needs and not putting the needs of others first. Basically, um, 
putting yourself first in line to take care of yourself rather than being there for everyone else. What are some things you can do throughout the day? Well, you can allow yourself to get away from whatever you were doing and go for a short walk. If you're in a family with kids, you could say mommy needs 10 minutes and go into the bath and just lock the door and take some time for yourself. Practicing emotional self-care also means saying no to obligations. When you feel you're maxing out, it's really okay and highly recommended to not go. So saying no to obligations, setting healthy boundaries. Emotional self-care means saying yes to yourself, which means being open and curious as to your emotional state throughout the day and being kind and and catering to your needs as if you were soothing a small child. Next slide. Two case studies. One, it was a night nurse who came to me and wanted to lose weight. She, of course, after a night shift of taking care of patients throughout the night, she would come home in the morning physically exhausted, mentally drained, emotionally fatigued. And she would eat and gain a lot of weight because of all these behaviors. So with her, since every client is unique, I thought, we'll try this. I asked her whether she had a beautiful shawl or a scarf she could put around herself. And she said, yes. Then I said, do you like slow sodium broth or tea? And she said, well, I like the broth. So I, we decided to try this new behavior. The next time she came home from a night shift, she would boil the water, put the broth in a beautiful bowl, sit on her couch and put the scarf around her shoulder. And that did the trick for her. It calmed her, it soothed her, and it took care of the core need, which was giving back to herself. Now, this is one individual case study, and there are many. Uh, every person is unique. And um, the second one is a highly successful CPA, a woman who was married to a, a very ill husband who called and texted a lot, even during our sessions. And she couldn't drive by Crush Cakes, which is a bakery in Santa Barbara, without getting a treat. And she would say, I need a treat. And I said, well, I don't believe you need a treat. You need a break. And she learned to delegate more, to not answer all his calls. And after maybe four to five months, she finally was able to drive by the bakery and take care of herself in different ways. Now, this is a, just a very short description of some of the interventions. We're all very, um, we're multifaceted beings and it's just really fun for me and meaningful to design rituals and practices for each client. Next slide. One of my quotes is that I really, really like, it's not about just losing weight. It is about creating a lighter existence, both physically and emotionally. And Brianna Wiest is a young poet and her self-care quote is very meaningful. She says, self-care is not just soft baths and chocolate cake. It's making the decision to create a life we don't need to regularly escape from. So self-care is not selfish. It's not a luxury. It's important for our well-being. So give yourself the oxygen first. Is there one more slide? No. <laughs> so that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> well, thank you, Petra. I mean, just wonderful advice um, for mindfulness, not only for eating habits, but also for daily living. And this is so important, especially for patients undergoing fertility treatments, because mm -hmm. Infertility can be a time of uncertainty. It can create anxiety. There's um, changes in how you're feeling as you are on different hormone treatments um, that can cause 
differences in eating patterns and stress. And um, these all techniques are very helpful in helping to reduce stress as you're going through fertility treatments. Um, so thank you for providing those insights. Um, I'm going to talk now on the more of the science of infertility and we'll talk as well why um, having a healthy weight is so important. Um, when we talk about the definition of infertility, we define that in patients who are under 35 years old, if they've been trying to conceive for at least a year, and in patients who are over 35 years old, if they've been trying to conceive for six months. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to understand how age is related to infertility. And as women get older, um, both the number of eggs in the ovaries, but also the quality of the eggs goes down. And this creates an age factor, meaning that the chance of conception per month goes down with uh, female age. And we start to see this become more problematic after the age of 35, where you can see that um, conception rates drop to about uh, less than 15% per per month. And this correlates with the percentage of genetically normal eggs going down with age. Okay, next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Women are born with all of the eggs that they will ever have at birth. Um, and the eggs start out in the millions. And then by the time um, a woman hits puberty where she starts to get her period, um, she's lost a significant portion of the eggs in her ovaries. And these eggs uh, numbers decline steadily until menopause when the periods stop because there are no more eggs being ovulated each month. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So when we are seeing a patient for the first time for a fertility evaluation, First, we do a detailed um, history, medical history review. We do a physical exam, and then we do a series of diagnostic tests. Next slide. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at predominantly is ovarian reserve, or the number of eggs in the ovaries. And we do this a few different ways. One uh, is with a blood test called an AMH, which, which is anti-malarian hormone. And this is a marker of the total number of eggs in the ovaries, and it's a relative number, not an absolute number. And then we do blood work on the second day of the period to look at a hormone called FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. And the FSH is important because it uh, is secreted from the brain and it stimulates the ovaries to release one egg each month. And as the FSH increases, it's the body's way of telling, um, telling us that it's having a harder time getting an egg to ovulate and be released. We also do a pelvic ultrasound and look at the ovaries. And here is an ultrasound image of an ovary. And the black circles within the ovary are follicles where the eggs are located. And we use the, the number of resting follicles to give us a sense of how many eggs are in the ovary and if it's normal or abnormal. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Um, as part of the fertility evaluation, we also look at male partners and perform a semen analysis to look at the concentration and motility of the sperm. Next slide. Part of our physical exam for an initial patient is to calculate the body mass index. And this is a calculation of an individual's weight divided by their height. And it's used to estimate if an individual's weight is appropriate for their height. So a normal BMI is between 18 and a half and 24.9. An overweight BMI is 25 to 29.9. And an obese um, BMI is greater than 30. And these numbers do have implications for fertility. Um, next slide. So there was a recent study published in um, a journal called Fertility and Sterility, and it looked 
at birth weights associated with uh, BMI in patients undergoing in vitro fertilization. And this study um, was done using data, national data from the Society for Assisted Reproductive Technology or the SART database. And it was um, done by one of our own laboratory directors, Sankita Jindal. So next slide. And what they found was that the ideal BMI for um, having the best pregnancy rates with IVF is the normal weight BMI between 20 and 25. As um, patients became overweight with a BMI between 25 and 30, pregnancy rates started to drop and they continued to drop as BMI increased. Um, and this, there has been data for a long time showing that obesity is related to an increased risk of miscarriage. Um, in patients who are trying to get pregnant naturally, having, being overweight or obese also can impact hormone levels and cause problems with ovulation or releasing an egg each month and lower natural conception rates. So having a healthy weight is very important, not only for natural pregnancy, but also for in vitro fertilization treatments. Okay, next slide. So some of the treatments that our patients undergo, um, one is called intrauterine insemination. And this is a process where we try to optimize natural pregnancy. We oftentimes give a pill for patients to take for five days at the beginning of a cycle, which can help more than one egg be released. Or for patients who do have a problem with releasing an egg uh, in general, this can help um, balance hormone levels so that an egg is released. We bring patients in for ultrasounds to monitor how that follicle is developing, and then give an injection called Ovidrol to cause that egg to be released. And then the next day, we can perform a procedure called an insemination, where um, the partner comes in, gives a sperm sample. We concentrate the sample, put it in a catheter, and then inject it into the uterus. Um, so this is a, a way of natural pregnancy called insemination cycles. Next um, slide. The other form of fertility treatments that we perform is in vitro fertilization. This is a little bit more involved process where patients take injections every day for 10 to 12 days. During that time, they do need to come into the office every few days for blood work and ultrasounds to track the progress. And then two weeks into the process, they have a procedure to extract those eggs. Um, next slide, please. That procedure is done under anesthesia, so the patients do not feel anything. And we do a vaginal ultrasound, and we have a needle attached, and the needle goes through the vaginal wall into the ovary, and we suction out those eggs that have been produced. This is about a 15-minute procedure, and then patients go to the recovery room for an hour. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Once the eggs have been retrieved, we then um, fertilize the eggs sometimes with a procedure called intracytoplasmic sperm injection, where one sperm is injected into the egg to ensure that uh, fertilization is successful. Mm -hmm. uh, ICSI is also used in patients who have a male factor in fertility where sperm counts may be low. Okay, next slide. Mm -hmm. Um, we utilize the embryoscope, which is time-lapse imaging of embryo development, and this allows us to be able to track if embryos are developing at a normal rate or if there's any abnormalities with their development. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. And when the embryos um, are cultured for five to six days, they need to reach a stage of development called a blastocyst. And at this stage, we can do a biopsy of the outside of the embryo to test to see if they're genetically healthy. Because again, a lot of reasons why patients are not getting pregnant is because the embryos they may be creating might be genetically abnormal. 
And so by doing embryo biopsies, we're able to identify which embryos are normal, and then we can transfer one of those embryos to the uterus to improve pregnancy rates. So when we transfer a healthy embryo, we get um, live birth rates of 50 to 60% and implantation rates of 75 to 80%. Next slide. Mm -hmm. So for a list of our um, current promotions, you can visit our website and those should be up to date. Okay, next slide please. And if you're interested in learning more about your uh, individual fertility, um, you can schedule a consultation with any one of our physicians at Southern California Reproductive Center. Mm -hmm. Next slide. And if you're interested in learning about um, your mindful eating habits or uh, wanting any tips with mindful eating, you can schedule with Petra. Um, yeah. May I offer an initial um, consultation, a complimentary consultation to assess uh, whether the patient and I are a good match and um, they can schedule through my website as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. So now we'll take questions um, for either myself or Petra mm -hmm. and you can put them in the chat. Okay, um, so the first question here is what supplements do you recommend someone who is 40 years old with a good AMH to take? Um, what are your thoughts on DHEA if you don't have diminished ovarian reserve? Um, so in general, we recommend that all patients who are trying to conceive take a prenatal vitamin. We also recommend that you take vitamin D um, on top of the prenatal vitamin. And the prenatal vitamin should contain folic acid, at least 800 to 1,000 micrograms. Other supplements that are good for fertility is CoQ10, and this is a potent antioxidant. Um, all antioxidants are good. So I tell patients that you can get antioxidants either through supplements or through healthy eating. Um, a good way to get uh, antioxidants is through eating fresh berries. Um, green tea is also a good antioxidant. Antioxidants are good for egg quality. Um, DHEA is a weak androgen that um, in women who have low egg counts um, may help to cause more eggs to be present at baseline when we do stimulation. So in general, if somebody has a high AMH or above average AMH, I do not recommend um, DHEA. Mm -hmm. um, mm -mm. I think the next question is, can you speak to ketosis and fertility? Um, I don't know any specific data on being in ketosis and fertility. There is some data that diets that are higher in protein may have some fertility benefits. Um, I think that in general, I don't recommend extremes in terms of diet um, when you are trying to get pregnant. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily recommend being in full ketosis when you're going through fertility treatments. Um, but cutting out processed sugars, processed foods is um, a good way to have a healthy diet uh, for fertility. Um, is IUI an option for someone with low anti-malarian hormone? Yes, um, IUI can be an option for um, all different types of patients. Um, patients with low AMH um, can still be successful with IUI. Um, we just don't wanna spend too much time on IUI if they um, 
if their reserve is lower, they may need to move to IVF at a faster pace. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, how soon prior to egg retrieval should I start taking prenatal vitamins? Um, prenatal vitamins should be started as soon as you're thinking about getting pregnant. Um, it's good to take them a few months before pregnancy. You can take them any time before egg retrieval. There's no set time when they need to be started. Um, here's a question about what would you recommend for someone over 40 looking to get pregnant soon, but also in the obesity um, BMI range? Um, so for my patients who I see um, like this, I usually do some fertility testing um, up front to see how much time we have um, to work with weight loss. Um, one strategy is sometimes going through an IVF cycle and obtaining eggs, and then a patient can work with Petra or um, work to lose weight before um, the embryo transfer. Um, again, we want to try to optimize the pregnancy experience of, of being pregnant, having a healthy pregnancy, um, having a healthy weight in pregnancy. So if we can delay the embryo transfer and allow for a patient to um, reach a, a healthier weight, um, we prefer to do that. Do you have any tips in that situation, um, Petra? <laughs> well, um we don't lose weight overnight, of course. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage the person to ask the question to give me at least three months mm -hmm. <laughs> to um, to get down to a reasonably healthy weight and um, without any stress, because stress, of course, got, uh, causes us to mm -hmm. hold on to the weight. So it's um, a lot of my work is about helping clients um, deal with stressors. Mm -hmm. And by doing so, the shift occurs internally and therefore you let go of the weight as well. So it's an inside out approach, but it's a minimum of three months to work with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why going through an IVF cycle sometimes is beneficial because that can be a stressful time period getting the eggs out, making embryos, and then taking a pause to really yeah. work on yourself, lowering your stress levels, losing weight, and optimizing your health before um, that embryo is transferred. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> what are general guidelines for diet and exercise during retrieval and implantation? Is it just general balanced diet, nothing in excess and usually 150 minutes of cardiovascular health per week. Um, so diet and exercise, I think healthy eating is important. So eating whole foods, um, lots of fruits and vegetables, foods that have um, a good nutrition um benefit that are providing you with vitamins and minerals, avoiding processed foods um, is really important um, before IVF or pregnancy. Exercise is um, good to be doing daily exercise, 30 minutes to an hour or a few days a week. Um, but there is such thing as too much exercise. So patients who are exercising um, an extreme amount doing very high intensity cardio, um, who have low BMIs, maybe putting a lot of stress on their body. And that stress can also lower, um, pregnancy rates, um, and IVF outcomes. So I would say a healthy amount of exercise is good. Um, but sometimes reducing that high intensity exercise, um, can be beneficial in integrating more yoga type practices. Um, if you have a low AMH, but aren't doing egg retrieval, trying to get pregnant naturally, should you take DHEA? 
Um, DHEA, again, is a weak androgen. It's not going to increase your natural pregnancy rates. Um, it's more something that we recommend prior to egg retrieval. Um, there's a question about acupuncture for fertility. Um, acupuncture is something that um, we encourage our patients to look into. Um, it can be a way of um, taking care of oneself, um, lowering stress levels. Um, it can you know, improve blood flow during fertility treatments. Um, so generally um, acupuncture is not harmful in any way um, during fertility treatments. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So question is, if, if a person naturally has a lower BMI, but has gained some weight, so the baseline weight is much higher, and now they have the ideal 20 to 25 BMI, is this a good thing? Um, yes, in general, I think for fertility outcomes, um, having the BMI um, be in that 20 to 25 range um, I've seen be more helpful than a low BMI. Um, Petra, do you have any um, techniques or do you ever help patients who have a very low BMI? Um, um, not habits? typically, no. Mm -hmm. I usually work with people who um, are in the higher um, BMI ranges. Mm -hmm. And with regards to diet and exercise, my recommendation is to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. You know, following uh, either the Mediterranean diet or the Harvard Healthy Plate or Blue Zones recipes or Dr. Mark Hyman, all these things are let, not to overthink. And I agree with Dr. Maxwell, the fresher the food, the better, avoiding processed foods for sure. And um, I think practicing slowing down in general and acupuncture, I think, is a good tool as an adjunct tool and also meditation. There are three apps that I like. The first one is Headspace. The other one is UCLA Mindful. And the third one is Calm. And building meditation into our daily lives is so important. I think especially if you're embarking on an IVF and, and pregnancy journey. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a great... Um recommendation for for the um meditation apps mm -hmm. there's a lot of good mindfulness yes apps out there now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um so we're just going to take a few more questions here um one question is can an increase in protein affect the quality of the eggs is there anything to consume that has proven to improve the quality of the eggs um so Again, egg quality is usually linked the most to patient age. And because women are born with all of the eggs they'll ever have, um, there's not a lot we can do about egg quality. But again, the things that we do know is the antioxidants are helpful um, and eating healthy proteins are good, um, lean proteins. Um, I would say fish and chicken um, are better, but again, everything in moderation. Mm -hmm. um, PCOS, a question about PCOS, um, polycystic ovarian syndrome. This is something that we work up, we look um, into and see if patients have this at their initial consult. And we do this through a series of blood tests as well as looking at the follicles on the ultrasound. So we would be able to identify if a patient had PCOS. Mm -hmm. um, let's see a question. I'm 41 with an AMH of 0.16. Would I be a good candidate for Clomid? Um, so I would say, it, we would need to do some more testing first before um, deciding if you were a candidate for Clomid or not. And this may be some additional laboratory tests, doing the FSH test on day two, 
and um, looking at your fallopian tubes and your partner's test results. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a question, do I need to get an MR, uh, Mirena IUD removed for stimulation? Um, so in general, we can leave the Mirena IUD in place during stimulation. Um, the exceptions would be patients with lower reserve um, may do better if we remove it, but for, the mo for most patients, they can keep the Mirena IUD in place. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. And here, um, last question, do you have any additional recommendations for diet supplements or preparing your body for pregnancy, um, especially someone who's high risk? This patient has lupus. Um, do you have any final thoughts, Petra, or, or recommendations for the group? Mm -hmm. I would always go um, and research which labs have the highest ratings, let's say on Amazon, <laughs> uh, by choosing, um, I'm not a dietitian. see, I come at it from the psychological angle, mm -hmm. but my supplements, when I go and buy them, I always want to make sure it's a, it's not Costco. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so invest, invest in really good supplements mm -hmm. is a recommendation and food is medicine let's not forget that what we put into our mouths makes such a difference the gut brain connection all of it so if there is a fresh market um, or a farmer's market nearby go and just load up and make it colorful like the rainbow and lots of leafy greens fruits and vegetables and yeah that's my recommendation not yeah. to open not I, overthink it. Yes. I think that's a good point. Um, it's important to remember that supplements are not uh, regulated by the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of supplement companies out there and they don't have to um, prove the quality or purity of what they're putting in their pills. And so, um, you know, going with good brands, brands that are potentially manufactured in the United States um, and getting most of your nutrition from your food yes. is really um, the best thing to do other than to, you know, buy a bunch of supplements. Mm -hmm. And let's not um, forget to mention that alcohol is um, really not good for us, <laughs> mm -hmm. even though it tastes so good to have a glass of wine here and there. So, limit or even um, limit alcohol consumption or stop would be mm -hmm. my advice for brain health and overall health. Yes, yes, that's a very good point. And alcohol, um, especially excessive alcohol at the time of ovulation um, has been shown to decrease chances of pregnancy in that month. And then obviously uh, alcohol cannot be consumed in pregnancy. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, thank you so much, Petra, uh, for being with us today. Thank you for and, having um, me. Yeah, some very good tips um, for wellness uh, during your fertility journey. Um, and thank you all for attending our webinar. Mm -hmm.